Good evening and welcome to the final event of Sanford University's first Provost Distinguished Lecture Series featuring N.T. Wright. And for those of you who did not attend the lecture on Monday evening, I am Mike Harden, Sanford University Provost, and I am so glad that you're here tonight. Part of my role as Provost at Sanford is to work to achieve the integration of academic and spiritual concerns and to maximize the impact of Christian faith on our educational programs and related campus groups here at Sanford. Thus, the idea for this lecture series was born in an attempt to fulfill this directive given to me by the university and our university trustees. If you miss the excellent Monday evening lecture, Space, Time, and History, Jesus and the Challenge of God, you can find it on our YouTube channel, youtube.com <coughs> YouTube slash Sanford Communications. Look it up on our website. Uh, <coughs> but we would, enjoy, we would appreciate you doing that if you have time. Tonight's event, however, is the final in this series. Tonight we have a dialogue on the meaning of Israel. This topic is hotly contested subject in the history of the church and one that deserves the respectful dialogue such as what will happen here tonight. It's my honor to introduce our two guests who will help us think more deeply about the place of Israel and its relation to the church. Our first guest is the, fe is the featured lecturer of this series, the Right Reverend Professor N.T. Wright. Dr. Wright has served as the research professor of New Testament and early Christianity at the University of St. Andrews, Scotland since 2010, and is quickly nearing his retirement at the end of this year. In his retirement, Dr. Wright will serve as senior research fellow at Wycliffe Hall at Oxford. Prolific author Dr. Wright has published more than 80 books. Our second guest is Rabbi Mark Kenzer, senior scholar and president emeritus of the Messianic Jewish Theological Institute, a graduate school preparing leaders for service in the Messianic Jewish movement. Dr. Kenzer is a co chair of the Helsinki Consultation uh, on Jewish Community and the Body of Christ and one of the founding rabbis of the Messianic Jewish Rabbinical Council. He is author of several books, including most recently, the book, Searching Our Own Mystery, published in 2015, Jerusalem Crucified, Jerusalem Risen in 2018. Dr. Kinzer is ordained in the Union of Messianic Jewish Congregations. I would ask that you refer to your program for the fuller biographies of our guests <clears throat> and, and instead of just my short brief ones here, but uh, please look there. Now, before I give the final introduction, I do not want this evening to pass without us acknowledging the significance of today's date. As we all remember, and probably remember where we were, 18 years ago on September 11th, our country was attacked and many Americans lost their lives. I would like for us just to take a moment of silence to remember those who died and those who sacrificed their lives to save others. Can we have a moment of silence, please? Amen. Finally, allow me to introduce one of my esteemed colleagues. He's really more than that to me. He's a close friend and someone who I very much enjoy uh, being around, Dr. Jerry McDermott. He is going to serve as tonight's moderator. Jerry is the Anglican Chair of Divinity and Director of the Institute of Anglican Studies at Sanford's Beeson Divinity School. He's a prolific scholar writing on subjects such as 18th century American Protestant theologian Jonathan Edwards, world religions, and tonight's topic, Israel. I'm personally grateful to Dr. McDermott's help with inviting both Dr. Wright and Dr. Kenzer on my behalf to Sanford University for the event tonight. Please help me welcome Dr. Jerry McDermott to the stage. <clears throat> <clears throat> wow. 
Well, um, thank you, Dr. Hardin. Let me apologize first. Uh, on behalf of uh, all of us organizers, we put on the web that this was going to be over at 8.30. Uh, it probably won't be over till near 9 o'clock. We're just telling you that ahead of time. If you have to leave at 8.30, don't feel bashful. We will understand. Now let me try to explain the format tonight. Uh, we worked out ahead of time two questions on which Dr. Wright and Dr. Kinzer agreed. And the two questions are as follows. Are non-Messianic Jews members of God's covenanted people? And number two, if so, do they as a people have a unique covenantal calling that distinguishes their calling from that of every other society or nation. So the dialogue is going to go as follows. Uh, Dr. Kinzer first is going to spend 20 minutes giving his answer to those two questions. And then Dr. Wright is going to spend 20 minutes giving his answer to those two questions. Then Dr. Kinzer will take 10 minutes to respond to Dr. Wright and Dr. Wright will take 10 minutes to respond to Dr. Kinzer. And then after that, we'll have roughly 30 minutes of Q&A with questions from you out in the audience. And here's how we're gonna do that. Uh, in the brochure that you were given when you came in, there's a, um, a little index card. And if you'd like to ask a question, write the question down on here during the 20 and 20. And at the end of the 20 and 20, um, pass your question, or during the 20 and 20, after you've finished writing the question, pass your question down to the aisle. And then at the end of the 20 and 20, I'm gonna ask the person at the end of the aisle to raise your hand if you have some cards with questions on them. And we have some ushers who are going to, who are going to come and collect the questions and bring them down to our, our two Beeson Bible professors to sort through and, and ask the ones that they think are most interesting and most provocative. Uh, uh, we have Dr. Osvaldo Padilla, who's a New Testament professor at Beeson Divinity School, and Dr. Ken Matthews, who's an Old Testament professor at Beeson Divinity School, who will be culling the questions and um, reading the ones that they think will be most helpful for this dialogue. So um, let me first ask Dr. Kinzer to come and give his answer to the two questions. A recent visitor to the uh, Messianic Jewish congregation that I am part of in Ann Arbor, Michigan, told me why she had come to our congregation. She had been reading N.T. Wright, and he had convinced her that the New Testament is a Jewish book. And that was enough to spark her interest in Messianic Judaism. Her experience was not unique. Professor Wright has helped many to see that the story of Jesus is incomprehensible apart from the story of Israel. Tonight's conversation is inspired by Dr. Wright's Israel-centered rethinking of the New Testament. And for that rethinking, I am profoundly grateful. Dr. Wright's magnum opus is entitled Paul and the Faithfulness of God. My focus tonight is on Israel and the faithfulness of God. God remains faithful to the genealogical descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That is, the Jewish people. Even when Israel is unfaithful. And this eternal fidelity grounds the church's assurance that she and the world will not be abandoned despite their own infidelity. As Dr. Wright has stressed, the New Testament describes 
the Jesus community in Israel-like terms. The 12 apostles correspond to the 12 sons of Jacob, and their destined role involves judging or governing the 12 tribes of Israel. Paul tells his Gentile converts that they are chosen, holy, and beloved. All biblical words associated with Israel's election. Peter's even more explicit, calling his hearers a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people. In their former manner of life, they had done what the Gentiles like to do. But now they are full members of the people of God, sharers of the promise bestowed on Israel. But surprisingly, this fact is not reflected in how the authors of the New Testament normally use the name Israel. The word appears 69 times. In only two of those appearances, Is there the slightest possibility that the name refers to any group other than the Jewish people? Likewise, the term Israelite appears nine times, and all nine instances refer to Jews. Some of these 78 texts speak critically of Israel's spiritual condition. The proclamation of Jesus as the Messiah, has produced a split within Israel. The remnant has embraced the message. The remainder have been, in Paul's words, hardened. In one verse, Paul even seems to imply that the Israelites who are hardened forfeit their right to the name Israel when he says, not all who are from Israel are Israel. Yet, in what follows that verse, Paul defies the expectations that his own provocative assertion has generated. The next three chapters of Romans employ the name Israel over and over again to speak of those Jews in particular. So, The Jesus community of Jews and Gentiles is described in Israel-like terms and on one or two occasions may even be called Israel. But the general practice of the authors of the New Testament is to reserve that special name for the genealogical descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Is this merely an unfortunate linguistic habit carried over from their Jewish past? I think not. If the New Testament is inspired scripture, such a consistent pattern must have theological significance. The simplest explanation is that genealogical Israel is called Israel in the New Testament because it remains Israel though all its members may not live in a way that honors the name, and though Gentile followers of Jesus now share in their covenantal riches. But how, how can genealogical Israel remain Israel despite its failure to receive its king? And what does it mean for it to retain that name? And why does God ordain that it be so? I'll take up these three questions, how, what, and why, in order. First, the how. Paul offers three answers to this question in Romans 9 through 11. All three answers converge in one crucial verse. If the part of the dough offered as first fruits is holy, then the whole batch is holy. If the root is holy, then the branches are holy. The context makes clear that the whole batch in the first half of the verse and 
the branches in the second half refer to the same group of people, namely the partially hardened remainder of Israel. Despite their incapacity to recognize Jesus as their king, they remain holy. Holiness is the mark of the people of God, and thus they remain as members of the community of the covenant. The second half of the verse says that they do so because they are branches which remain related to their root. The root is holy, and it imparts holiness to its branches. But what is the root? The context offers two possible meanings, and these options point to two of the answers that Paul gives to the question we are now asking. How, by what means, does genealogical Israel retain its identity as Israel? The first possible explanation of the root is that it refers to Jesus himself. Isaiah calls the Messiah the root of Jesse in a passage that Paul actually cites later on. In Romans. So it's not far-fetched that Paul might apply the image to Jesus. Paul has already said of Israel that from them, according to the flesh, comes the Messiah. In this verse, the genealogical bond tying all Jews to Jesus is the climax of Paul's impressive list of Israel's irrevocable privileges. This messianic interpretation of the root fits Dr. Wright's understanding of Jesus' messiahship. Dr. Wright views Jesus, Israel's king, as a one-man Israel. The king represents and embodies his people. That is what enables Gentiles who are united to Jesus to share in the inheritance of Israel. But that is also what establishes a bond with his fellow Jews, a bond which confirms their covenantal status, even when they prove unfaithful. The root of Jesse sanctifies even those branches who seek to distance themselves from him. The second possible interpretation of the root is that it refers to the patriarchs. In Paul's list of Israel's privileges, the next to last, just before the Messiah, is their connection to their ancestors who first received the covenant. Paul underlines the enduring power of the connection two chapters later when he says, as regards election, they are beloved for the sake of the patriarchs. In the final analysis, it's of little consequence whether the root in Romans eleven sixteen 16 is Jesus or the patriarchs. The wider context in Romans demonstrates that the Jewish people remains connected to them both. And that, and that this dual connection assures its enduring covenantal status. The root is holy, and so the branches are holy. The third answer to our how question, how, by what means, does Israel remain Israel, is found in the first half of Romans 11:16. If the part of the dough offered as first fruits is holy, then the whole batch is holy. The context suggests that first fruits here refers to the remnant, that is, the Jewish disciples of Jesus. Once again, Paul ascribes spiritual significance to a relationship of genealogical kinship. But this time, it is a relationship to, among flesh and blood Jews. 
who are face-to-face -face contemporaries. It's not a relationship to deceased ancestors or to a resurrected and transfigured Messiah. Paul asserts here that those known today as Messianic Jews or Jewish Christians mediate the sanctifying blessing of God to the rest of the Jewish people. So, Israel remains Israel despite its faulty response to its Messiah because the Messiah is joined to his people and remains faithful to them because his faithfulness embodies God's unflinching commitment to their ancestors and because a remnant of Israel has embraced the Messiah and stands in union with him before God on behalf of their brothers and sisters. These are the means by which God preserves Israel's holy identity after the death and the resurrection of the Messiah, the king which most of Israel still does not acknowledge. The New Testament offers less material to help us to answer our next question. What does it mean for Israel to be, still be Israel? What is genealogical Israel's role in this stage of history between the Messiah's resurrection and return? While the New Testament does not answer this question directly, there are several texts which emphasize Israel's role in preparing the way for the return of Jesus. These texts shed light backwards on Israel's significance in the era between the Messiah's two comings. In Luke 13, Jesus grieves over Jerusalem. In the past, the city opposed the divine messengers sent to her, and she will soon oppose the Messiah himself. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. See, your house is left to you. And I tell you, you will not see me until the time comes when you say, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. This is primarily a lament which anticipates the destruction of the city 40 years later. However, the passage ends with a ray of hope. God will return to the city and its people when they are ready to welcome the one whom he sends. This is what one scholar has called a conditional prophecy. It anticipates a future coming of God to Jerusalem after the destruction of the city in the year 70. But a condition must be fulfilled for the prophecy to be realized. That condition requires that Jerusalem welcome the one who comes with a reception equivalent to that given to Jesus by his own disciples when he entered the city on Palm Sunday. In other words, the return of Jesus is contingent upon Israel's proper response to him. This way of reading Luke 13 is confirmed by Peter's temple speech in Acts 3, where he addresses the people of Jerusalem and their leaders. Repent, therefore, and return, so your sins might be blotted out. And he might send Jesus, the Messiah appointed for you. Heaven must receive him until the time of the restoration of all the things that God spoke about long ago through the mouth of his holy prophets. The word translated here as restoration is found commonly in Jewish Greek of the day to speak of Israel's national restoration. Here that restoration is made contingent on Jerusalem's repentant embrace of Jesus as Israel's Messiah. 
Since the restoration was promised through the mouth of his holy prophets, it is certain to occur. But something must happen first. And that something is the repentant response of Israel. So Peter's temple speech confirms our reading of Luke 13 as a conditional prophecy. It also challenges us to take seriously the question posed to Jesus by his apostles before his ascension. Lord, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom to Israel? Traditionally, Christians have interpreted this question as a sign that the apostles have failed to grasp the spiritual nature of Jesus' kingdom. Just as they have failed to understand that genealogical Israel is no longer truly Israel. But the Greek word translated here as restore is the verbal form of the Greek noun translated in Acts 3 as restoration. Since the restoration in Peter's speech is focused on Jerusalem and Israel, it appears as though the experience of Pentecost after the ascension has not eliminated Peter's hope that God would restore the kingdom to Israel. These passages from Luke and Acts provide a helpful context for interpreting the teaching of Paul in Romans 11. He writes there that Israel has stumbled, but God will never let it fall. Moreover, Israel's stumbling has had beneficial effects. By their false step, salvation has come to the Gentiles. What result might then follow when Israel receives its balance, recovers its balance, excuse me? Paul answers this question immediately. Now, if their transgression leads to riches for the world and their loss to riches for the Gentiles, then how much more their fullness? What riches does he have in mind? What could be greater than the salvation of the Gentiles. He answers that question three verses later, for if their rejection leads to the reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? Should this phrase, life from the dead, be taken literally? Does it refer to the general resurrection which follows the return of Jesus? Interpreted in the light of Luke and Acts, the answer is yes. Israel's fullness implies national repentance in relation to Jesus, which then triggers the events leading to the return of Israel's Messiah and the renewal of the cosmos. Paul's point here is not merely the fact that the Jewish people will believe in Jesus before or at his return. That proposition has been a staple of much Christian theology for centuries. But it has not usually led Christians to appreciate the enduring covenantal significance of the Jewish people. The conversion of the Jews has simply been treated as one of a series of events to occur at the end of the age. Alongside the emergence of the Antichrist, the persecution of the saints, the convulsions of the natural order. In saving the Jews, it appears as though God were merely tying up loose ends. In contrast, the text we have examined suggests that the actions of genealogical Israel are central to the unfolding drama from beginning to end. It is their stumbling which enables the fullness of the nations to taste salvation, and it is their own fullness which triggers the renewal of the cosmos. Israel remains Israel, and God's actions in the world remain linked to his relationship to Israel, for the Father of Jesus remains the God of Israel. Thank you. Thank you very much for the chance to address these huge and complex and often contentious questions in such a warm atmosphere. I am grateful for a new friend who I've made today and for the chance we've had to chat beforehand, although we didn't actually discuss 
the subject matter for tonight. I'm sorry I have not had a chance to read all Dr. Kinzer's works, in fact, hardly any of it, but um, it's been really good to sense that he and I are in several ways on the same page, even though within that page there are then significant divergences. And I'm grateful for the kind remarks about my own work. And I should say, as a Gentile Christian, I grew up in the 50s and 60s very conscious of the horrors that had been perpetrated on world Jewry, European Jewry, immediately in the decade before I was born. And the first movie at which I ever shed tears was the movie Exodus. And uh, I have always, all my life, really since first being aware of it, had that sort of sense that we as Gentile Christians shudder when we think of all of that. In addressing the two questions which I've been asked to address, are non-Messianic Jews members of God's covenanted people, interesting phraseology, and do they as a people have a unique covenanted calling, etc.? I want to make some distinctions. The trouble with phrases like this is that they're very ambiguous and quite slippery, and I think that's always a danger when we're interpreting the New Testament and trying to summarize what's going on. And the most slippery of the modern words which are used in this debate, which Dr. Kinzer has not used, is a well-known word, supersessionism, which is regularly applied sometimes to people like me on the grounds that we supposedly take the church to be in some sense or other the new Israel in some sense which would make ethnic genealogical Israel either redundant or less relevant. In my book, I have tried, in my big book on Paul, I have tried to discuss that phrase, that word supersessionism and the other words that go with it. I find it singularly unhelpful although I am reminded that Professor John Levinson from Harvard has said famously that the most Jewish thing about early Christianity is its supersessionism, which kind of turns the thing round a bit, because when we look at the history of different Jewish movements in the 200 years either side of Jesus, we see many Jewish movements which were saying quite definitely, this is where our God is finally doing what he's promised, and if you don't join in, you are not really part of God's people. Effectively, that's what Qumran said. It's certainly what Bar Kokhva and his followers said in the last great revolt, 132 to 35, and in a sense, it is precisely what the Mishnah said in roughly 200, saying this is what being a loyal Jew now looks like, certainly not, therefore, the Sadducees and the others who deny certain things and go different routes. But that's perhaps a question we can park with just this initial gesture. My starting point for all of this, and I know that Dr. Kinzer agrees firmly with this, of course, is that whatever else we're going to say about Jews and Christians, Christians believe that Jesus of Nazareth was and is Israel's Messiah. There has been a great tradition of people saying, well, there was a Christian Messiah, but then there was a possible Jewish Messiah, and the Christian Messiah was inaugurating a spiritual reality, whereas we know that the Jewish Messiah was going to inaugurate uh, a worldly reign of justice and peace. And I want to say, as a Christian, that is a Christian misunderstanding, egged on by Platonism in the Middle Ages particularly, to ignore the biblical, indeed the New Testament, agenda for the reign of justice and peace, which the early church did implement in various ways through their care for the poor and so on. And that the idea that Jesus might be one sort of Messiah, but there might be another, I suspect is one that both Dr. Kinzer and I would reject. But as we're then going to say, what did early Christianity say about Jesus as Messiah, what did that mean? I think, again, we both accept the New Testament as the primary and authoritative witness, and it's on the basis of the New Testament that we make such case as we can. 
Jesus' first followers saw him as the embodiment of Israel's returning God, as well as the embodiment of Israel itself. He was Israel in person, as I believe, and I believe the New Testament says, he was Israel's God in bodily form. So that the gospel writers tell the story of Jesus' life and death and resurrection as the proper fulfillment of Israel's scriptures. They are not, as in many Christian, would-be Christian readings, a way of saying, this was the mechanism by which you go to heaven. They were saying, this is where that whole story, the Tanakh, the, 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 the law, the prophets, and the writings, this is where that narrative was all going. This is fulfillment. And therefore, if Jesus is Israel in person, where he is, there is true Israel. And I believe that is then validated for the early Christians in Jesus' resurrection, because resurrection was never something that people thought would happen to the Messiah because the Messiah was not supposed to die. But resurrection was what was promised in various Jewish traditions to all God's faithful people at the end. So when one person was raised from the dead in the middle of history, that was seen by many in very early Christianity as saying Jesus is somehow strangely the embodiment in one person of Israel. So where he is, there is true Israel. And the early Christians drew on scriptural sources from the Hebrew scriptures to amplify and fill out this point. Second Samuel 7 was a favorite text where God promises to David that he will build him a house which turns out to be a person, which turns out to be David's son, who will be God's son, but that is in answer to David's desire to build God a house so that the place where God will finally dwell on this earth is not a building of bricks and mortar, but a person. The house is Jesus himself. And in Psalm 2, which the early Christians draw on regularly, as they do on 2 Samuel 7, in Psalm 2, we see the land-based Abrahamic promises extended, not denied, not nullified, but extended, so that the same language of territorial promise is now used when God says to the anointed king, the Messiah, ask of me and I will give you the nations for your inheritance and the uttermost parts of the world for your possession. In other words, lift up your eyes and see, as Isaiah says, don't confine yourself to this one territory. There is a whole world and it's all going to belong to the Messiah. And that, of course, is then amplified again in the Isaianic servant passages, particularly in chapter 49, when God says to the servant, it is too light a thing that you should simply restore the, the tribes of, of, of Jacob. I will give you as a light to the nations so that my glory may extend into the whole world. And back to the earlier messianic promise in Isaiah chapter 11, that when the root of Jesse rises, resurrects to rule the nations, in him the nations will hope. So it's no surprise when in Romans chapter 8, we've spent a bit of time in Romans 11, and I'm going to be responding to that later. But in Romans 8 already, Paul retells the story of the Exodus, only now it is the new Exodus in the Messiah and by the Spirit. And for Paul, the inheritance which is promised, and the Greek word kleronomia is the regular word which would be used for the inheritance which was originally the Holy Land, the inheritance is now the whole creation. The whole world is now for Paul, God's Holy Land. So within that, it's no surprise that in Galatians 3 and in Romans 4, Paul speaks of God's covenant with Abraham. That's our first question about members of God's covenanted people. Paul speaks of God's covenant with Abraham in Genesis 15 being fulfilled in all who believe. Now, of course, in Galatians, the emphasis there is to assure 
Gentile believers in Jesus that they are genuine members of the family of God. And that's, I'm sure, something Dr. Kinzer and I are totally agreed on. But Paul expresses it in a number of interesting ways. In Romans 4, 16, he speaks about the members of the family of Abraham who are defined by Torah, by the Jewish law. But then he quickly adds, not of Torah only, but of faith, of messianic faith. In other words, he's making a distinction between those who simply are Torah-based Jews and those who, as well as that, are Torah plus messianic faith Jews, so that he can daringly, in that little advance promise in Romans 2, 25 to 29, he can talk not as some translations say about the true Jew, but simply the Jew who is the one inwardly. And when Paul uses that beloved word, eudaios, ho eudaios, the Jew, and redefines it like that, there ought to be a sharp intake of breath. Many commentators seem, in my view, to fail to see that. And so, again, it's no surprise that in Paul we find reference, as in Hebrews, as in Revelation, to a new sort of city to which people belong, a heavenly city. And again, the problem with that Galatians 4, Hebrews 11 and 12, Revelation 21, is that we have tended in the Christian West to think platonically, and we think of a heavenly city as a non-spatio-temporal reality up in the sky or metaphorically up in the sky, a place where God's people go when they die. That is not in Jewish tradition or in early Christian tradition what the heavenly Jerusalem means. The heavenly Jerusalem is the city which, as Psalm 87, drawn on by Paul in Galatians 4, says, is the city to which all God's people from whichever nation already belong and which will come to be a reality, as Jesus taught us to pray, on earth as in heaven. And that is, for Paul, the very root of his doctrine of the unity of the church, so that when he says at the end of Philippians chapter 3 that we are citizens of heaven, this does not mean, as generations of expositors have said, that, oh well, like Philippians being Roman citizens, they will one day retire and go back to the mother city. That's not how the language of citizenship works. Rome was already overcrowded and have a, had a food shortage, and the reason they founded colonies was to keep those people away from Rome and to make them agents of Roman civilization where they were. So Philippians 3 joins Galatians 4 and those other passages, speaking of the heavenly city, not as a platonic heavenly city, but as the promised new Jerusalem which will come on earth as in heaven. So, yes, it all does come down eventually to how we read Romans 9, 10, and 11. And I've spent maybe half of my professional career coming back to those chapters again and again, and we could have week-long seminars easily on, that, on those passages, those chapters. And one verse which is really striking in Romans 11 is Romans 11:23. And I remember discussing this with Lloyd Gaston, who was a famous Canadian scholar who would argue that for Paul, Jews had to stay Jews and Christians had to stay, Gentile Christians could be Christians, that was fine. But Lloyd Gaston said to me once, but I wish Paul hadn't written verse 23, because that's where Paul says, if they do not remain in unbelief, then they can be grafted back in again. And here's the point. Why is Paul grieving in Romans 9? What is he praying for in Romans 10? My prayer is that they may be saved. And he answers his own question when he says, if you confess with your lips that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So where is the idea coming from that this will happen, but at the last minute, immediately before Jesus returns? You've heard an elegant exposition, and I'm going to answer that later. But it seems to me we have to take seriously what Paul is really arguing in Romans 11. He is facing, and he could see it with prophetic prescience, he is facing the early version of what became Marcionism in Rome. 
Rome had a strong tradition of being anti-Jewish at the time, and Paul could see that if things went on as they were, when the, when the, the Jews had been expelled from Rome um, under Claudius, but now that Claudius has died, they were going to come back under Nero, there was going to be anti-Jewish sentiment in Rome in general, and perhaps in the Gentile church in Rome in particular. And Paul could see only too clearly that some Gentile Christians would say, well, this movement started off as a Jewish thing, uh, but now it's over to us. And those Jews, happily, have been written out of all this. And Paul is saying, absolutely not. When you walk past your local synagogue, you can never say God has finished with them. They are beloved for the sake of the fathers. But does that mean that he is ipso facto arguing for a large-scale, last-minute conversion of all Israel? I don't see it in Romans 11. In my early days, I wanted to see it in Romans 11. And as I've done the exegesis over the years, I find it less and less plausible. He is arguing against the idea that the Jews who do not currently believe are automatically excluded. Rather, they remain among those who are in some sense or other to be explored. And I think Paul is being cautious here, doesn't want to be too def def definitive. They are beloved in that sense. Like he says in 1 Corinthians 7, that uh, when an unbelieving spouse is with a believing spouse, are the children holy or not? Yes, he says the children are holy. They are sanctified by the believer. Does that mean they are saved? Does that mean they're automatically Christians? I don't think so. The holy means that God is reaching out in their direction. God has not rejected them, but it doesn't automatically mean that they will one day come to faith. So crucially, does the New Testament say that the Abrahamic covenant has been fulfilled in Jesus and by the Spirit? Absolutely yes. Does the New Testament say that Jeremiah's promised new covenant has been inaugurated? Absolutely yes, in Jesus and by the Spirit. So what if I take this line, do I give as my answer to the second question, do the Jewish people who currently do not believe in Jesus as Messiah have a unique covenanted calling? I don't see that calling as such in Scripture. I see a possibility, and with that possibility, I see something whose analog, I think, is sacred space. The first time I went to the Western Wall in Jerusalem on Good Friday in 1989 and prayed there, I had a strong sense of this being sacred space, which I as a Christian have learned over many years to recognize, and I don't think I'm fooling myself. Does that mean that the Western Wall as it is now is the permanent residence of the God of Israel? No, I don't think so. I believe God resides in and as Jesus and the Spirit and is the triune God who is Lord of the whole creation. But as with sacred space, so with chosen people, there is a memory, there is a holiness, there is something which as Christians we respect and which we honor and we long to see uh, coming to whatever fulfillment God has. I, I cherish one of the great Jewish songwriters who died a year or two ago, Leonard Cohen. Even though it all went wrong, he wrote, I'll stand before my Lord in song with nothing on my tongue but hallelujah. That, it seems to me, is a wonderful expression of faith, even though it's all gone wrong. One minute, thank you. Do they therefore have a unique calling? This brings into play, we haven't discussed this, the multiple theories, both of Christian Zionism and of Jewish Zionism. Those are very complicated stories, and there is no automatic one size, this is Jewish Zionism, this is Christian Zionism. They are, they are complicated and they've shifted over time, and there are different views in different parts of the Jewish and Christian world. Do they mean that therefore the present unbelieving Jewish people have a distinctive role in current geopolitical affairs? I do not see evidence for that in the New Testament. That doesn't mean that present Middle Eastern politics are irrelevant to the Christian gospel, quite far from that. 
But I wouldn't end on a negative. Let me end by reminding you what Romans 15 says, and Dr. Kinzer referred to this already. Rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. And that rejoicing, which I think Dr. Kinzer and I just sense a little bit in each other's company. Uh, we may not agree about everything, but the point is that God has fulfilled in Jesus his covenanted purposes. And we, in faith and hope, and with a proper reverence before a mystery which may ultimately be insoluble in the present age, we celebrate what God has done and whatever in the future God will do. Thank you. In my response, I thought it <clears throat> might be best to focus on the text I was una unable to uh, address in my presentation, but which uh, Dr. Wright said something about, which is uh, the Romans 11, uh, 26 text, 25 and 26, which has uh, uh, been so controversial. And uh, Dr. Wright has written extensively about this and uh, uh, I don't know that I'm going to be saying anything new, but I think it is, uh, it's actually a crucial text for our discussion here, and I wanted to make uh, clear how I would address it and Dr. Wright's thinking on the passage. Uh, in, uh, in the RSV, oh, excuse me, yes, I actually have the text there. Excuse me. For I do not want you, brothers and sisters, to be ignorant of this mystery, that a partial hardening has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in, and in this way all Israel will be saved. And so the question there is, what or who is all Israel there? Uh, and I would contend that all Israel there is actually a reference corporately to the Jewish people. Uh, that's a reading that Dr. Wright uh, doesn't, uh, doesn't take. Um, and I think that, uh, that Dr. Wright's reading of the text can make sense if you take the overall approach to Romans 11, which he takes and which he actually articulated. And I, I think the fundamental question is, what is the issue that Paul is addressing in Romans 11? At the very beginning, in Romans 11.1, 1, he says, he asks the question, has God rejected his people? And he says, of course, by no means. And then in verse 11, he says, as Israel stumbled so as to fall. And then he says, of course, God forbid, by no means. Now, Dr., what Dr. Wright understands this Question, these questions as, uh, as meaning is that Paul is affirming that Jews can still be saved. That the issue he's addressing in Rome is that there are people saying that Jews can no longer be saved. And that therefore all of these arguments in Romans 11 are attempts to argue against that premise. Now, I think, I think it's highly unlikely that that was the issue that Paul was addressing. Uh, I think it's highly unlikely because uh, I, don't, I know of almost no time in the history of the church where that's been an issue that's even been discussed. Um, Dr. Wright did refer to Marcionism, but to my knowledge, Marcionites never said that Jews could no longer be saved. If, if, if a Jew became a Marcionite, then they could be saved. Uh, in, in some of his other writings, he has uh, cited uh, a, a second century a text called the Epistle of Barnabas um, as putting forward this position, but I don't think that's actually what the Epistle of Barnabas is saying. Uh, in fact, in Christian history, other than maybe under uh, the Nazis, I know of no time where Christians simply said a Jew could not be baptized and be saved as long as they changed their thinking and gave up all of these Jewish practices, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. 
And so I think it high, given the fact that I don't see evidence of it in Christian history as a whole, I think it's highly unlikely that 20 years after the death and the resurrection of Jesus, when almost all the Jewish apostles and first followers of Jesus who were Jews are still alive, um, that this was the issue. I think the question that Paul is addressing in Romans 11 has to do with the corporate destiny of the Jewish people. He's saying, has God forsaken his people? genealogical Israel as a nation, as a corporate entity. Has Israel stumbled so as to fall as a nation? And I think when he says no, then he picks it up later on in the text, and then he says all Israel will be saved is his answer to ultimately to, to that question. Uh, I don't think that precludes Paul grieving over his people. He he sees that many of them are in a, in a bad way spiritually at the time. And he's not convinced that every individual Jew is going to be inheriting the life of the world to come. I don't think all Israel means every individual Jew. I think it's a statement about a, a corporate destiny of the Jewish people uh, as a people. And it's something that Paul sees as a... As a a, mis a, a mystery of something that will happen in connection with the Messiah's return. A final point on this is I think it, I don't see it as something happening just when Jesus returns. I set this in co the context of those texts in Acts and in Luke. And I see it in fact as a part of the process that ultimately leads to the return of Jesus. That it is Israel's affirmation of saying, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, fulfilling the conditional prophecy of, uh, of Luke chapter 13, responding to the appeal of Peter in, in Acts chapter 3, that ultimately triggers, leads to the outworking of the, 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 of the fullness of the coming of God's kingdom in the world. That kingdom I see much as Dr. Wright does, as something that is cosmic, it involves the whole world, but I believe it also continues to have a, a center point, um, which is in the city of Jerusalem um, and the land of, of Israel. Uh, and I think that's, um, that's very much the way Jews of the first century actually saw things. The general view was the promise of the land referred to the world as a whole, not just to the land of Israel. But that did not preclude there being a center to that renewed world, and that center being the land of Israel and uh, the city of Jerusalem. So. Thank you. There are many, many, many things we could take up, and Dr. Kinzer is being very uh, uh, gracious in <laughs> giving a quick sketch there. I have taken for many years um, the saying in Romans 11:26 about all Israel in the same sense which I think ought to be, though it isn't incontrovertible, for Galatians 6:16, 6, where Paul talks about the Israel of God. Now, Galatians, as you will know, is a passionate plea for the unity of Jew and Gentile in the Messiah. The end of Galatians 3, Paul says, if you belong to the Messiah, you are Abraham's seed, heirs according to the promise. And the point is, neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, no male and female, you are all one. This is Abraham's family. That's how the whole argument of Galatians goes. And if in chapter 6, verse 16, his phrase, the Israel of God, was a surreptitious way of saying, but actually here, are, uh, here is a Jewish group, either the Jewish Christians or uh, Jews yet to be converted, then he would actually have subverted his entire argument in the letter so far. That is probably just about the majority opinion of exegetes, although it is controverted, but I think it's very clear. And I see Romans 9 to 11, and I've argued this out in chapter 11 of my book, Paul and the Faithfulness of God, 
I see Romans 9 to 11 as a very, very carefully constructed whole. It's one of the most careful constructs in all of Paul's writings. And sometimes I have to say, scholars seem to think that Paul was just dictating on the fly and making it up as he went along and suddenly this idea occurred to him so he put it in. But when you study it closely, Romans 9 to 11 really works as a whole, as a, a kind of a circle, comes back to where it began. And I see all Israel in 1126 answering exactly to what he says in chapter 9 verse 6, which Dr. Kinzer quoted in his first uh, address where Paul says, not all those who are of Israel are Israel. That's his opening line of the actual argument after the initial prayer. And by the way, the way Romans, 11 work, Romans 9 to 11 works is a wonderfully Jewish piece of writing because it starts with a lament, it ends with praise, and it centers on intercession with the history of Israel in between. What does that sound like? It sounds like a psalm, and I think that's quite deliberate. Moving from lament through intercession to praise, reflecting on, on God's story with his people en route. It's an amazing piece of writing, but the way that it works is that 9.6 goes with 11.26, where there is a redefinition of Israel. And Paul knows perfectly well that he is polemically redefining just as he does, as I said, in Romans 2, 25 to 29, haven't got time to look at all of that, but you could check it out, or in Philippians chapter 3, verses 2 to 11, where he is in, again engaged in polemical definition. He says, we are the circumcision, hemis garest in heperitome, we who worship God in spirit and boast in the Messiah Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. He is taking these precious words, eudaios, peritome, and I think Israel as well, and daringly saying, they belong to the Messiah and therefore they belong to all the Messiah's people. This is not a transference from Jewish people to Christian people or perish the thought to Gentiles who happen to be Christians. It is the saying that Jesus himself is where all the promises find their yes. That's what he says in 2 Corinthians chapter 1. All the promises of God find their yes, all the promises find their yes in him and therefore all those who are in him inherit those promises. So in Dr. Kinzer's opening remarks, I sensed something of the slipperiness of which I was, sorry, it's not meant to be a rude word, it's just linguistically, there isn't time in 20 minutes to say everything spelt out. But when Dr. Kinzer said that um, this confirms the Jews' covenantal status, I wanted to say, well, yes, they are genealogical descendants of Abraham. Paul says they are beloved for the sake of the, of the patriarchs. And yes, in Romans 11, he is saying very clearly, don't you despise them, don't you write them off. I'll come back to that in just a second. That is a sort of covenantal status, but you can't argue from that to saying that they're automatically saved, and Dr. Kinzer agrees with me on that, and I don't think you can argue either to say that because of what he says there, therefore there must be either a final last minute return to the land or a final sudden large scale conversion. I should say, by the way, some colleagues of mine in the Guild very kindly last year gave me a festschrift, a volume of essays in honor of my 70th birthday. Towards the end of that collection are two essays, one by Richard Hayes, who substantially agrees with me on all Israel, and the other by my own brother Stephen, who is also a New Testament scholar, who disagrees with me on that point. So you can go and read those essays and make up your mind. I haven't yet had the conversation with my brother, but one of these days I shall. These things happen. Um, so the idea, the very, it's a very appealing idea that Dr. Kinzer has that Messianic Jews mediate the sanctifying grace, I think that's the phrase he used, um, of God to the rest, the currently unbelieving Jews. I can see something of that in theory. 
I'm not sure how that works in practice, and I'm still not sure whether that actually means anything other than God always holding open the prospect that if any Jew turns to Messiah Jesus, then of course that Jew can and will be saved. Uh, and I, I would love to spend more time discussing Luke 13 and Acts 3. I'm not sure that they can bear the weight, and it is a very considerable weight that Dr. Kinzer puts on them. That prophetic saying at the end of Luke 13 has been interpreted in many different ways, of which Dr. Kinzer's, though interesting, is only one. And going back to Romans 11, I was surprised by what Mark said uh, just now, because it seems to me that even though there may be not very much evidence for later Gentiles rejecting the possibility of Jews being saved, Romans 11, 17 following really does look like that to me, where Paul is addressing the, the, the Roman Christians and saying, you will say, verse 19, branches were broken off so that I could be grafted in. In other words, he's imagining Gentile Christians in Rome saying they've been cut out so that I could come in in their place. That is classic supersessionism. And Paul's saying, no, absolutely not. If you start talking like that, you'll show that you haven't got real faith yourself and you might be cut off. There's a severe warning. So I think we need to do that bit of exegesis much more carefully there. And back to Acts chapter 1, verse 6 when the disciples say, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? I have a good friend who is a colleague in uh, St. Andrews, Scott Haferman. He's retired now just recently. And we frequently came across this in seminars. And I used to say to the students, do you think the answer that Jesus gives is yes, but or no, but? And Scott Haferman would say, no, but we're not restoring the kingdom to Israel. That comes later, but you've got a job to do in the meantime. I am convinced that Jesus' answer to the question is yes, but. Yes, this is the kingdom being restored to Israel because Israel's Messiah, Jesus, is enthroned as Lord of the world and sends out his messengers into all the world to announce that he is Lord. And that is what restoring the kingdom is all about. But it doesn't look like they thought it would. It doesn't look like a kingdom set up in a geographic, present geographical Jerusalem with Jesus and or his followers ruling the world from there. It looks like them going out in the way that Jesus did, where the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head, and in sharing the suffering of the world, bringing the message of God's love to that world. So this show, well, I'm done. This show will run. <laughs> Um, this show will run and run, and we're looking forward to your questions. But I'm really grateful to open the discussion up in such a, I hope, a friendly way. And uh, no doubt there are more insights to come. But I suspect that Dr. Kinzer and I will have this conversation again, either by email or in person. And it's very good to have begun it here. Thank you. Well, I messed up. I forgot to have you pass your questions and have them be collected at the end of the first 2020. So, so please, uh, the ushers will come down now and get them from the people on the ends and bring them to Dr. Padilla and Dr. Matthews. I apologize, Dr. Padilla and Matthews, for not giving you time to sort them out. But, but maybe while you're looking them through, we can ask... Um, and see if Dr. Kinzer and um, Dr. Wright would like to come up for a little two minutes of each to, to respond. Now, Dr. Kinzer, would you like to? While, while they're taking the time to sort out the questions, it's gonna take them some time. Sure, yeah, yeah. The microphones and then it can be more of a conversation. Sure, yeah. Well, one of the uh, one of the texts I think that's uh, that's crucial for the reading of Romans nine through eleven uh, that I would love to see Dr. Wright do more with is uh, the Song of Moses in Deuteronomy thirty two, uh, uh, and Dr. Wright focuses a lot on Deuteronomy thirty uh, and 
uh, this uh, text that speaks about Israel's uh, restoration and return um, and repentance um, as background to Romans 9 through 11. But the text that's especially cited is this Song of Moses. And the Song of Moses in Deuteronomy 32 tells the story of Israel. And it begins with God showing this great favor to Israel. And then Israel makes God jealous by going after gods that are no gods. And so God then decides that he is going to make Israel jealous by showing his favor to nations that are not nations. And uh, in the original context of Deuteronomy 32, this is like God showing favor to these nations by raising them up uh, in a military sense to, uh, to conquer Israel for periods of time and to rule over Israel. And then at the end of the Song of Moses, what happens is that God exercises his judgment on those nations and God gives ultimately victory to Israel. But in the, uh, the Greek translation of, of, uh, of Deuteronomy 32, the very last verse is um, the summons uh, to the nations to worship God, worship God with his people, meaning with, with Israel. So that in, in that version, the conclusion are the nations and Israel together worshiping God these nations that were no nations that God used to make Israel jealous. Paul takes that and works with it throughout Romans 9 through 11. Uh, and uh, what I would see going on there is, well, and then Paul cites uh, that final verse of Deuteronomy 32 in his closing list of these bi key biblical texts in, in Romans 15. Uh, and so what I see happening there is, again, Paul telling the story of Israel and the nations uh, and uh, God making Israel jealous through his showing favor to these nations in order to, to ultimately see all of Israel be saved. Uh, and then Israel and the nations together coming arm in arm before God in the praise of God, which is the picture of Romans 15. And so I would like to, it's just, if you could share, say a little more about Deuteronomy 32. Yeah, I, I and, love Deuteronomy 32, and of course, in a very short spiel, there's no time yeah. to say, and if you know my books, you'll know that I have actually expatiated on this at slightly more length. And uh, Deuteronomy 32, uh, the Jewish historian Josephus refers to Deuteronomy 32 very interestingly in his Antiquities of the Jews, and says that Moses wrote this great poem as a prophecy of things that would come to pass, and Josephus says, and that are coming to pass in our own day, which is an extraordinary thing, so that um, Josephus is saying that the Pentateuch, the five books of Moses, is not just the backstory of Israel, it contains the whole story of Israel. And I think Paul would agree, because I've just got Deuteronomy 32 open in front of me, and verse after verse crops up somewhere in Romans, including Vengeance is Mine, which comes in chapter 12, and Praise, um, w w rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. That comes in 15, as you said. What I don't see there is that the, the use that has been made of that jealousy motif in, by some interpreters of Romans 11, where the idea of making um, Israel jealous, Paul says uh, that he is magnifying his men ministry to the Gentiles to make he says, to make my flesh jealous, which is interesting, there's echoes of Romans 7 and 8 there, and he says, and so save some of them. Now, as with 1 Corinthians 9, where Paul says, I've become all things to all people that I might save, and he really ought to say all, but Paul is a missionary, he knows perfectly well not everyone is going to believe. Um, he's had lots of experience, so he says that I might save some. And here, I think he's explicitly not saying all. He's saying, I'm constantly looking and hoping and praying that some of my fellow Jews will come to faith. And I think Paul sees that as an ongoing process in his ministry and as long as the world lasts until Jesus comes again. I don't see in there or in, in here any sign that this must include a sudden restoration 
of all Israel, still less that this might have a geographical focus, which is obviously one of the back questions which we haven't really got into. So anyway, we've, that's, that's a quick flip around one particular yes. issue. Yes, yes. Okay, thank you. Um, um, Dr. Matthews, can you ask the first question? As it turned out, we have an overwhelming number of questions, which is, uh, I think, a tribute to our participants invoking and encouraging such questions. Uh, this question is for each of you. How should we think about modern Israel in terms of uh, eschatology, if at all? I think it's obvious that um, the theological premises that uh, I have and that Dr. Wright would have would lead to different conclusions on this question. My own approach to it uh, is one in which I see the enduring significance of the land, as I said, not as as the inheritance, but as the center of a redeemed world. Uh, the, I, I see Jerusalem as retaining this unique uh, significance as the center of, uh, of that renewed cosmos. Uh, and so, when there is this dramatic event in the 20th century, where the Jewish people uh, in large numbers return to the land, reestablish their corporate presence in, th in the land, I, I think that has to be taken as having some kind of theological significance. If, if one accepts my premise of the enduring covenantal status of the Jewish people and the, and, and the continuing significance of the land and of the relationship between the two, between the Jewish people and, and the land. And if one is expecting some kind of particular events at the end of the age preceding the return of Jesus that are related to the land and related to the Jewish people and the city of Jerusalem. Uh, but for me, that does not translate into seeing the state of Israel as somehow some kind of special sanctified reality. I, th I think sometimes Christian Zionists can take that leap um, from the recognition of the importance of the land and the importance of the people and the, uh, even the, the eschatological significance of the return of the Jewish people to the land and make the leap immediately into seeing the state of Israel uh, as being, uh, as having this unique uh, significance. I see it as much more an instrument of the life of the people rather than as being so significant in itself. I, would, I, I put less emphasis on the state and the possession of sovereignty in the land uh, and, and see more significance in just the, the presence of the Jewish people as a people living again in the land and governing their own affairs uh, and, and having this uh, presence within the city of Jerusalem that they do have. Uh, so I see this as all of eschatological significance. I just think we should be cautious in, in developing scenarios of what exactly is going to happen or in drawing certain kind of political um, implications from these theological convictions about, for example, the, uh, how the, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict should be resolved. Uh, and I think there has to be a, great, a, a, a much greater measure of flexibility in how that area is approached. And one could do that and still hold to the view uh, that I hold of the eschatological meaning and significance of the return of the Jewish people uh, to the land which have obviously been smoldering under what we've said or around what we've said. Um, 
there have been many times when, almost in a romantic sense, I wish I could believe something like what Dr. Kinzer has said there. I, I simply, the more I've looked at it over the last 50 years, the less plausible it seems to me. And that's not to say that uh, I wish the Jews hadn't returned to, to the land in the way they did, etc. But there are many um, different strands of uh, Jewish Zionist um, theology and indeed Jew Jewish anti-Zionist theology and some of the most yes. strident opponents of the founding of the modern state of Israel and certainly some of the most strident denouncers of it as a, an act of God are certain parts of the Orthodox Jewish community as, as, as we both know. Partly on the ancient grounds um, which have a Christian analog, interestingly, that one ought not to, quote, force the redemption, unquote. That's, uh, there's many Jewish teachers who would say only God can do the redemption. And if this is a human work, then that cannot be right. And some people have tried to say, well, God is using human means to do it. Fine. We Christians have that same problem. What's the relation of good works to ultimate salvation? Is it just God going to do it or do we have to do some of it? So the, these are the sorts of questions that you run into from many different angles. And likewise, there are many different Christian readings of different types of Zionism. But this is a very new situation. I mean, it's hard for us perhaps to realize that 100 years ago, 150 years ago, the great majority of Jews in the world would not have thought that actually a return, aliyah, whatever, was either an imperative or an eschatological thing. And it's particularly in America with American dispensationalism that it's become a huge bit of the Christian scene, which again was quite new. And the earlier restorationist Christian Zionists would have seen it quite differently to how the dispensationalists do. So all this is by way of saying it isn't a question of Dr. Kinzer representing one point of view, me representing another, and that's it. There is a wide variety of positions, both Jewish and Christian. For myself, I do not see the present, uh, the, the, the 20th and 21st century uh, uh, Middle Eastern political events as really in any direct way a fulfillment of either Daniel or Ezekiel or Act 3 or any such thing. I see them as part of the ongoing, extraordinary geopolitical events which have unfolded, which particularly uh, highlighted, of course, the Holocaust, the Shoah, and the return or the reestablishment of some kind of state as a reaction to that, perhaps a necessary reaction. And I can give a Christian account of that in terms of a general Christian political theology, but I do not believe we can do um, a biblically based eschatological reading of that as though these are highly significant events. I should say this debate too has taken place in my own family. My wife grew up as a, an Elim Pentecostal and her late and lamented father was a local preacher who was a passionate Schofield reference Bible dispensationalist who could prove the whole thing from Daniel and Ezekiel and Zechariah and everything else. And I loved listening to him, but I never actually believed it. So sorry, that's where I am. Well, that was a big question and it did deserve some unpacking. Uh, Dr. Pitti is going to ask the next question, and, and I'm hoping that we can get a lot of questions asked, and, and so maybe I'll ask our, our, our speakers if they could try to be as economical as possible so that we can get a, a good number of questions in. Dr. Padilla. This is a question for both of you. Um, it's actually two questions, but I think they're related. <clears throat> the question is the following. Has God always related to people through Jesus Christ? Or does Israel always come first, even in the eternal decree? Or, as in a different way, is the promise of Jesus a priori to God's covenant to Israel or a posteriori to God's covenant with Israel? You go first this okay. time. <laughs> My turn to go first, apparently. Um, there are two ways into this. When we're thinking about Jesus, we're thinking about the historical Jesus of Nazareth. It seems initially odd to talk about God doing everything through Jesus of Nazareth before the conception and birth of Jesus. However, in the Christian church, from very, very early on, as I said, Jesus' followers recognized that the living God of Israel had 
come to be human. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. And that precipitated a fresh reading of Israel's scriptures, which, to cut a very long story short, results, for instance, in a reading of Genesis 1, which would say that God made humans in his own image so that it would be utterly appropriate and natural for him to become the ruler of his own world by becoming human. And if the sovereign God is high and lifted up and inhabits eternity, etc., then we're already talking in Trinitarian language that God from the beginning, there was something about God, if you like, which was pre-incarnate, which was going to become incarnate in Jesus. Um, and then I would say, with Second Samuel 7, God called David and his family to be uh, the focal point of Israel so that he could himself become the world's redeemer by becoming Israel's Messiah. So that I want to say, theologically speaking, this is all to do with a triune reading. I could put the Holy Spirit in there as well, actually, of both Genesis and the call of Abraham and the call of David. But of course, it appears historically the other way around. But I believe that when God called Abraham, God already had in mind that he would himself come and be the redeemer of the world by becoming Israel's representative. That's the, the way I would tell the story. I suspect we're quite close on that. Yeah, yeah actually, I would agree very much with, uh, with Dr. Wright. Another text that points in, uh, in this direction is uh, Ephesians chapter 1. Uh, and, uh, you know, this is a text, uh, I mean, I, I take uh, perhaps a somewhat eccentric view of, uh, of Ephesians 1 uh, in that I, uh, I see the, this blessing that Paul has uh, as, as focusing especially on Israel and then expanding uh, to, uh, to include the, the nations who are joined to Israel. But regardless, what, what, Paul, uh, what Paul writes is, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus, the Messiah, who has blessed us in the Messiah with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. And holiness, blamelessness, election, being chosen, these are, again, the words of the covenant. And, uh, and the, the picture it's being given is that election from the very beginning, from before the beginning, is something that is in uh, in Jesus the Messiah, the one yeah. who is yeah. ultimately uh, will be the uh, the incarnation of the eternal Word. Yeah, yeah, good. Matthews. This question is for uh, Dr. Wright in Romans eleven twenty five. What does fullness of Gentiles mean, and how does this relate to all Israel will be saved? course written about this at length in both my commentary and in Paul and the Faithfulness of God, um, to try to summarize. Um, I think Paul is being quite cautious in Romans 11. I don't think he's saying that he knows exactly either what ultimately will happen or how it will happen, but he sees that in the purpose of God, there is a plan to save a vast number of Gentiles. And the phrase, the fullness of, of the Gentiles, is a way of saying the total number that God has in mind. I don't think it means all Gentiles. Um, I don't think Paul is a universalist, um, but it clearly means a lot more than are saved at the moment, I, I would, would think. Um, and so I think he's saying that God has made a breathing space. The translation which Mark put on the, on the screen, which was I think the NRSV perhaps, yeah, um, remember, whatever it, it was, it's quite tricky because the phrase there Paul uses is that a hardening has come upon Israel and the Greek phrase is apomerus, which could mean a partial hardening or it could mean a temporal, a temporary hardening. And indeed Paul uses the same phrase in a temporary sense in, in Romans 15. And I think Paul is saying very much in line with how many Jewish apocalyptic writers were thinking at the time, why has God not closed the deal, finished the job, sorted the whole thing out. 
And many writers were saying, God is staying his hand, staying judgment in order to allow a breathing space so that more people may repent and be saved. And the hardening looks as though Paul is saying that the rejection of the Messiah might have incurred instant judgment, but no, God has said, no, instead they will be remaining there and be hardened, as in Romans 9, in order that there is time and space for the Gentiles to come in. That's a very mysterious thing. But so I don't think it's that then that will suddenly be reversed. Anyway, that's, that's the basic answer, and I, I could expand it further. Question for both. How does the occasional nature of the letter to the Romans affect your reading of chapters 9 to 11 and the question of uh, Israel's salvation? Well, I think it actually showed up in our responses to the text because we were, what uh, Dr. Wright and I were doing in our, uh, in, the in the disagreement we have in exegesis is actually a disagreement over the occasion or the issue that Paul is actually addressing. You know, is he addressing one of the terms that, that Dr. Wright uses in his writings? Is he addressing the question of the savability of Jews? Um, or is he addressing the question of the corporate destiny of the Jewish people? And, and so, the, uh, whatever the question is he's addressing, it's related to the issues that Paul sees as significant for, for, for something on the ground in the, in the Roman church. Um, so, at least to that extent, I think the, the occasion and the circumstances that are, are actually crucial for, for being able to understand what Paul is, is actually trying to say. Yeah. Um, and again, I, I find um, this notion of the savability of Jews, as, that Paul is arguing for the savability of Jews, all that would mean is that he is arguing that Jews are no worse off than Gentiles. Uh, at, whereas it seems like he's making a much bolder argument here about the, the sacred status of Jews, that they are holy in a way in which, uh, in which just the other nations are not, at, at, that gives them some kind of special co covenantal connection, rather than simply they're no worse off than Gentiles, they can be saved just as much as Gentiles can. Yeah, it's interesting because the question rather implies that if this was not an occasional piece, then it would be kind of scripture set in stone, but the occasional nature would somehow relativize it. I want to say all scripture from Genesis to Revelation is occasional. Somebody has written it and edited it, and the theology of the inspiration of scripture, which I have lifelong embraced and, and cherish, is not that this stuff is not occasional, but that God the Holy Spirit is working precisely in and through those occasions to bring about the God-given response to and address to those occasions, which we call Holy Scripture. And that always the church at its best has done the exegesis trying to figure out why this writer wants to emphasize this in order to be sure that we are hearing as best we can what God wants to say to us through it. Otherwise, Scripture just becomes, in the famous phrase, a nose of wax which you can bend this way or that. Now, I think, I think in a sense, I want to say both what I say and what Dr. Kinzer says, but nuance it slightly differently. And I do see in Romans 11:11, 11, 11, and then in Romans 11:13, and then in Romans 11:17, following, I see a definite address that Paul thinks that there are some in Rome who want to say they have stumbled so as to fall. In other words, they are now unsavable. Um, and I think it's partly to do with, as I said the Jews coming back to Rome having been banished, and in AD 54, in, uh, when Nero comes to the throne, the Jews come back. 
And we know what that's like in a community, in a tight community, when uh, a particular ethnic group has gone and suddenly they're back. Think of the problems of immigration that we have, certainly in my country at the moment. Huge resentment. And if the Roman church has become a Gentile organization, then Paul sees a real danger there. Anyway, we could argue that, but I want to say, Again and again in Scripture, we need to pay attention to the occasion. Galatians is arguing with very similar texts that uh, Gentiles really are true members of the family of Abraham. So the argument has to run that way for the inclusion of Gentiles. Romans here is arguing, if you like, with the same text against the opposite danger of Gentiles who are saying, we're it now and those Jews can go and do their own thing. And, and this is the irony, actually, of um, the Messianic Jewish position that um, there are many Jews, non-Christian non Jews in today's world, who don't want to be told that Jesus is their Messiah as well. Um, and I think Paul would say that's the real letdown, because if Jesus is Messiah, he is Messiah for Israel and the world. That, and Paul would see that refusal by some liberal Christians to evangelize Jews as the real form of anti-Judaism, which he's opposing here. So, my friends, there are many different wrinkles to this and many oddities about it, and, and it behoves us to, to pay attention to the text and its occasion very, very carefully. This question also, I think, can be addressed by both of you. Do not Christians sometimes forget that Jesus is a Jew, and therefore, should we not follow him in observing the holy days, eating kosher food and so forth, um, and would this not be uh, more attractive to Jews who might be more willing to accept Christ if uh, Christians uh, reflected this in their worship and practice? Wow, that, can I have a go at that first? That's very, very interesting. Um, I don't know that you can ever tell what's going to be attractive to people. Um, uh, 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 the whole time in my world, in, in the church world, people are always saying, if only when we went back to the original prayer book, then people would love that and would come back. Or if only we could have saxophones instead of organs, then people would come to, you know, <laughs> you, you just can't second guess what people are going to find attractive. However, however, I have often, when thinking about this question vis-a-vis -vis Jews and Christians, used a version, my own Midrashic version, of the parable of the prodigal son, seeing the prodigal who limps back from his wild lifestyle as the Gentiles coming in, and the older brother, seeing this crazy party going on, says, that's not for me. And there are many times when Gentile Christians have celebrated the party, in such a way as you cannot blame the older brother for not wanting to join in. And I, I take that very, very seriously and with, with shame as a Christian, and that if the Christian church had done the messianic agenda from Psalm 72, looking after the poor and helpless and, and, and getting all that stuff done on the ground, then all sorts of perceptions would have been different. Um, however, it's very clear in the New Testament that uh, in Romans itself, that the, is the issue of kosher food and special days is something that Christians oughtn't to differ over. So that if my brother wants to celebrate um, certain aspects of Torah and I don't, then this shouldn't stop us sharing the Lord's meal and his faith together. Romans, that's what Romans 14 is all about. Um, the attempt to say that we ought, that Christians ought to keep kosher runs afoul of um, Mark 7, where Jesus says he's making all foods clean, and certainly Paul's attitude to the food laws in 1 Corinthians 9, for instance, which is a passage we haven't discussed, to the Jews I became as a Jew to win Jews. That's a extraordinary. To those under the law, I became as one under the law, not being myself under the law, but ennomos Christu, in the law of the Messiah. What does that mean? Come on, Paul, we want some footnotes. I mean, so, um, <laughs> Uh, and, and there's many passages like that which mean that I think, uh, it, uh, though I understand why the questioner would say that, I don't think that's actually the answer. But Mark, you might disagree on uh, it. Um, no, I don't uh, exactly disagree. Uh, my reading of particularly a text like 
Galatians is that it is a text addressed to, uh, to Gentiles who are, who've come to faith in Jesus, who are being drawn to take on Jewish life in a, in a full sense, to be circumcised, to observe, observe Torah. Paul seems to think that this is a very serious problem. Uh, and I, th I think one of the reasons that it is, he sees it as a problem is, in some ways, it's not recognizing the, the work of Jesus, that Jesus, what Jesus is doing for the nations of the world, that in his death and in his resurrection, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, that God is coming to the nations of the world and not seeking to make them Jews but seeking to bring them into relationship with Jews. And I think one, one can already see this in, uh, also in Acts of the Apostles and uh, the Jerusalem Council. And again, my understanding here of what's going on in the Jerusalem Council is that there is this recognition that the Torah is something that has application to all the followers of Jesus, but in different ways, and that there are, there are laws of the Torah that apply to the, the, the priestly tribe. There are laws of the Torah that uh, 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 apply specifically to, um, to uh, Levites, um, and there are laws that apply to Israel, and there are laws who apply to non-Israelites who are living in the midst of Israel, and there are laws that apply simply to humanity. Uh, and I think that, uh, I, I don't actually think it would be uh, particularly persuasive to Jews to simply have all Christians trying yeah. to kind of pretend that they're Jews. That's very, very interesting. That's a very interesting way of putting it. Yeah, and I, there's a footnote I'd add, but we must move on to another question. Yeah. This is for uh, Professor Wright. Uh, in light of the fact that in the Acts of the Apostles, after every missionary trip, there is a return to Jerusalem. Wouldn't this go in the favor of Dr. Kinzer in viewing Jerusalem as the center of worship? That's a very interesting idea. I, I don't think so. I mean, Paul's missionary strategy um, is, is very interesting to preach to the Jews first and also to the Greek. How that worked out in relation to the agreement in Galatians 2 where he and the Jerusalem pillar apostles agree that they will go to the Jews and he to the Gentiles. Is that a geographical or an ethnic distinction? Did they stick to it? Looks as though they didn't because we have Peter showing up in Corinth and Paul having to navigate that. It looks as though that was a temporary arrangement. But then there's nothing much made of that regular return to Jerusalem. And indeed, the first missionary journey, that doesn't happen. Paul and Barnabas go with John Mark to Cyprus, then they go up to what we call southern Turkey. Mark leaves them, then he goes back to Jerusalem. But then Paul and Barnabas continue their work, and they go back to Antioch. And it's an Antioch to Antioch trip. Later, Paul does go back to Jerusalem in the middle journey, um, but then... Uh, nothing is made of that. He says, goes up and greets the church and then goes back north up to Antioch. Um, and then the final journey, of course, he's going to Rome and he says in Romans and, uh, and so on, he wants to go to Spain. And some people have speculated that he would have gone back to Jerusalem after that. We have no particular reason to suppose he would. So um, it, it is one of the really interesting things about Paul's missionary strategy, the, the role of Jerusalem in it. And I don't myself see the force of that particular argument, though I've never quite heard it put like that before, and I'll have to contemplate. Uh, now, Mark, did you want to answer that? Uh, well, yeah, this uh, discussion of this point is actually uh, part of my own mo recent work uh, in uh, the book Jerusalem Crucified. And, uh, I think actually the, the Jerusalem Council in Acts 15 is, immediate, is immediately after Paul's first missionary journey, uh, which is in oh. Acts 13 or 14. So he's yeah. coming to Jerusalem yeah. uh, after the first missionary journey. That's as very well interesting as because that's actually a very contentious point which, on which we 
both agree, um, because many people put the Jerusalem Council quite differently. But I don't think that he's going with Barnabas to Jerusalem to finish off the journey. I think yeah. they've come back to Antioch, and then trouble is brewing. We've got to go and sort it out. So that's not a strategic, we always go back to Jerusalem business. Right. Mm. Uh, it, my perspective on it, though, is I'm looking at it less in terms of what what is the historical Paul doing and looking at it in terms of the, the author of the book of Acts okay. and the point that the author of the book of Acts is trying to make through the continual return to Jerusalem. Okay. Uh, and uh, my argument in, in Acts is that uh, the book ends in, in Rome uh, in an, leaving the ark incomplete. In other words, that the, what happens in terms of the, the movement, the rhythm of Acts, is always going further out and further out and then always coming back to Jerusalem. That's very interesting. And that I, the book ends in Rome yeah. with the message being this story is not to be completed until the ark is completed and the return is to Jerusalem. Yeah, we've, wow. we, we've, um, I, I love incomplete arcs, but I'm not yet persuaded by that one. <laughs> they, you know, you know um, uh, I, I think we've run out of time for questions, but, but let me ask if each one of you wants to make a one-minute closing statement. Well, I, I, the one thing I would actually simply like to say is, uh, again, to express my gratitude to, uh, to Dr. Wright for all that he's done. We, we obviously disagree on some important matters, but um, within the overall framework of, uh, of theology and biblical scholarship, we, we agree on a lot more than we disagree with. And this is actually the first time that uh, the two of us have been able to get to know one another, and uh, I wanted to express my gratitude to uh, Beeson and Sanford for providing this, uh, this opportunity for this e event for many reasons, but in part uh, with the hope that our dialogue will continue. Yeah, I, I would hope so too, and I have to say that from my point of view, I haven't been privileged to know that many Messianic Jews. I've had some friends in that category, but to have this as part of the Provost Distinguished Lecture Series, which it is, is just a real treat. And I think congratulations to the local community for, for doing that. But I want to say to, to Mark particularly, I'm very much aware, and I hope this has come out, that to be a self-confessed Messianic Jew is to put yourself in this very awkward position where there must be many other Jews, including many Christian Jews who aren't quite so explicit, as it were, will look at you with anxiety, and where many Gentile Christians really almost literally don't know what to do with you. And um, I, it seems to me that that's where this proper sense as a Gentile Christian of being the younger brother and of needing to honor and embrace the older brother, um, is, is just so important. And I hope we've modeled that a little bit tonight. Um, but also to say the task of exegesis and the discipline of hermeneutics of saying, how do these texts actually mean what God wants them to mean? And how do we instantiate that in actual communities and prayer and policy? This is, I think, the task we would both want to bequeath to everyone here. It's ongoing. It's not a matter of a quick fix. Here's three texts from Daniel. Here's um, 1948 and then end of conversation. By the way, 1948 was a good year. I say that for, for quite other reasons. But, uh, um, so let me so, turn so this over you. to Dr. Hardin. Thank you very much. Tom and Mark, thank you so much for a delightful evening, very stimulating. I'd also like to thank uh, Dr. McDermott, uh, Dr. Matthews, Dr. Padilla, uh, Dr. Uh, Dean Sweeney. I think they earned their salaries tonight as I saw that stack of cards they were sorting through and trying to do in great haste. Uh, thank you all for your hard work. Let's give all of them a round of applause. Because one of the individuals that I would like to thank 
think now, wrote a lot of my script for me. Uh, she did not put this in the script, so I'm going to go off script for just a second and say that the events over the last few days, the organization, the planning, and all that goes on behind the scenes could not have happened, absolutely would not have happened without the hard, dedicated work of four ladies. I do not know that I can see them, but Nydia Spence, Kristen Padilla, Kim Eckerd, and Susan Kalovich, they have put in way more hours than they deserve, <clears throat> that I deserve to ask of them. They have been fantastic and working. Can we give them a round of applause? I began dreaming and praying about this lecture series really more than two years ago, and tonight's event was the final realization of seeing those prayers answered. In a world in which we live and watch on the evening news so often, we see uh, things done in tweets, we see incivility at every turn, we see the role of the university having really no place in, in today's society and questioned at every turn. And in particular, we see the role of the church in being a Christian as, as not having any value. And, and certainly, it's almost an oxymoron for a lot of people to think about having a Christian university, that you can do both with integrity and to the highest standards. My dream for these lectures was that that would be illustrated and that we could see embodied what I believe God calls us to do and what I believe in particular that God has called Sanford University to be. And that is an embodiment of where those two things come together and shine into the world and our community and our students take what is learned here and go out into the world. One of my favorite phrases of Dr. Wright is, he talks about Christians as being at the points of pain and suffering in the world. What I hope that these lectures become is a place where we learn how to embody, as you've seen tonight, civility in conversation, dedication, love, and that we as the Sanford community model that and go out and that we bring that bomb of Gilead to those places where the world is at pain and bring out of it not the evil that normally comes, but the good and the love that God has called us to bring forth. And so I want to thank y'all for being that embodiment and showing us how to do that and especially, Tom, for all of your time here spent with us. Well, I have three quick announcements. First, <clears throat> uh, if you enjoy Dr. Kinzer tonight, he's coming back. He will be back with us in Beeson's Divinity School's annual Anglican Theological Conference, September the 24th and 25th, on the theme, The Jewish Roots of Christianity. Dr. Kinzer will return as one of 12 conference speakers and you can purchase tickets at Beeson Divinity School's website, uh, of course, beesondivinity.com. <coughs> the second announcement that I would like to let you know about is tonight's uh, dialogue was recorded and will be posted on our YouTube channel. So again, if you will go to the Sanford website, you can find directions on how to get to the Sanford YouTube channel. And then last but not least, as a thank you gift from Dr. Wright and his colleague, Dr. David uh, Simuth at the N.T. Wright Online Center, for attending tonight, they would like to give you free enrollment in one of his online courses. Let me say, I can give a testimony here. I think there's, is there 14 now? something like that, I have taken them all, and they are wonderful. Don't watch TV, watch these lectures. They are much better than what you will find on TV. So what <clears throat> I highly recommend them to you, and the slide that you see up in front of you uh, gives you a way of doing that. It's real simple. 
And if you have uh, one, uh, a child with you below the age of 12, they can do this in a second for you. Just take out your phone, type the word Sanford, all lowercase, to the number 44222, <clears throat> then hit send. Okay, again, if you brought any children with you below the age of 12, this will be no problem for them. Uh, Finally, you'll, you will be asked to provide an email address, submit your email address, and a link will be sent to you to receive a coupon code to enroll in an online course for no cost. This offer will expire in 30 days. However, <clears throat> once you enroll in the course, you have lifetime access to the course. So I hope you'll take advantage of that. And as again, I can highly recommend all of them to you. Before we depart tonight, please allow me to offer up a prayer in all of our behalves. Let us pray. Almighty God, Father of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, whom you sent to die and be raised so that all tongues tribes and nations might worship you in unity. We thank you for what we have heard this day and we ask for your wisdom in the reading of your word and the proclamation of your gospel. Please watch over us as we leave this place. We humbly ask all of these things in the name of your son and our savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Good evening.